Practical Strategies for Psychological Measurement. The learning objectives for this section are 1. Specify the four broad steps in the measurement process. 2. Explain how you would decide whether to use an existing measure or create your own. 3. Describe multiple strategies to identify and locate existing measures of psychological constructs. 4. Describe several general principles for creating new measures and for implementing existing and new measures. 5. Create a simple plan for assessing the reliability and validity of an existing or new measure. So far in this chapter, we've considered several basic ideas about the nature of psychological constructs and their measurement. But now imagine that you're in the position of actually having to measure a psychological construct for a research project. How should you proceed? Broadly speaking, there are four steps in the measurement process. A, conceptually defining the construct. B, operationally defining the construct. C, implementing the measure and D, evaluating the measure. In this section, we'll look at each of these steps in turn. Conceptually defining the construct. Having a clear and complete conceptual definition of a construct is a prerequisite for good measurement. For one thing, it allows you to make sound decisions about exactly how to measure the construct. If you had only a vague idea that you wanted to measure people's memory, for example, you would have no way to choose whether you should have them remember, them remember a list of vocabulary words, a set of photographs, a newly learned skill, an experience from long ago, or have them remember to perform a task at a later time. Because psychologists now conceptualize memory as a set of semi-independent systems, you would have to be more precise about what you mean by memory. If you're interested in long-term episodic memory, memory for previous experiences, then having participants remember a list of words that they learned last week would make sense, but having them try to remember to execute a task in the future wouldn't. In general, there's no substitute for reading the research literature on a construct and paying close attention to how others have defined it. Operationally defining the construct. Once you have a conceptual definition of the construct you're interested in studying, it's time to operationally define the construct. Recall that an operational definition is a definition of the variable in terms of precisely how it is to be measured. Since most variables are relatively abstract concepts that can't be directly observed, like stress, an observation is the heart of the scientific method conceptual definitions must be transformed into something that can be directly observed and measured. Most variables can be operationally defined in many different ways. For example, stress can be operationally defined as people's scores on a stress scale, such as the perceived stress scale, or it could be cortisol concentrations in their saliva, or it could be the number of stressful life events they've had recently. As described below, operationally defining your variables of interest may involve using an existing measure or creating your own measure. Using an existing measure. It's usually a good idea to use an existing measure that's been used successfully in previous research. Among the advantages are that A, you save the time and trouble of creating your own, B, there's already some evidence that the measure is valid, if it's been used successfully, and C, your results can more easily be compared with and combined with previous results. In fact, if there already exists a reliable and valid measure of a construct, other researchers might expect you to use it unless you have a good and clearly stated reason for not doing so. If you choose to use an existing measure, you may still have to choose among several alternatives. You might choose the most common one, the one with the best evidence of reliability and validity, the one that best measures a particular aspect of a construct that you're interested in, such as a physiological measure of stress if you're most interested in its underlying physiology, or even the one that would be easiest to use. For example, the 10-item personality inventory, or TP, is a self-report questionnaire that measures all the big five personality dimensions with just 10 items. 
It's not as reliable or valid as longer and more comprehensive measures, but a researcher might choose to use it when testing time is severely limited. When an existing measure was created primarily for use in scientific research, it's usually described in detail in a published research article and is free to use in your own research, as long as you give a proper citation. You might find that later researchers who use the same measure describe it only briefly, but provide a reference to the original article, in which case you would have to get the details from the original article. The American Psychological Association also publishes the Directory of Unpublished Experimental Measures and Psych Tests, which are extensive catalogs and collections of measures that have been used in previous research. Many existing measures, especially those that have applications in clinical psychology, are proprietary. This means that a publisher owns the rights to them and that you would have to purchase them. These include many standard intelligence tests. Uh, the Beck Depression Inventory, and the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Details about many of these measures and how to obtain them can be found in other reference books, including Tests in Print and the Mental Measurements Yearbook. There's a good chance you can find these reference books in your college library. Creating your own measure. Instead of using an existing measure, you might want to create your own. Perhaps there is no existing measure of the construct you're interested in, or existing ones are too difficult or too time-consuming to use. Or perhaps you want to use a new measure specifically to see whether it works in the same way as existing measures, that is, to evaluate convergent validity. In this section, we consider some general issues in creating new measures that apply equally to self-report, behavioral, and physiological measures. More detailed guidelines for creating self-report measures are going to be presented in Chapter 7. First, be aware that most new measures in psychology are really variations of existing measures, so you should still look to the research literature for ideas. Perhaps you can modify an existing questionnaire, create a paper and pencil version of a measure that is normally computerized or vice versa, or adapt a measure that has traditionally been used for another purpose. For example, the famous Stroop task, in which people quickly name the colors that, are, that various color words are printed in, has been adapted for the study of social anxiety. People high in social anxiety are slower at color naming when the words have negative social connotations, such as stupid. When you create a new measure, you should strive for simplicity. Remember that your participants are not as interested in your research as you are, and that They'll vary widely in their ability to understand and carry out whatever task you give them. You should create a set of clear instructions using simple language that you can present in writing or read out loud, or even better, both. It's also a good idea to include one or more practice items so that the participants can become familiar with the task and to build in an opportunity for them to ask questions before continuing. It's also best to keep the measure brief to avoid boring or frustrating your participants to the point that their responses start to become less reliable and less valid. The need for brevity, however, needs to be weighed against the fact that it's nearly always better for a measure to include multiple items rather than a single item. There are two reasons for this. One is a matter of content validity. Multiple items are often required to cover a construct adequately. The other is a matter of reliability. People's responses to single items can be influenced by all sorts of irre irrelevant factors. Misunderstanding the particular item, a momentary distraction, or a simple error such as checking the wrong response option. But when several responses are summed or averaged, the effects of these irrelevant factors tend to cancel each other out to produce more reliable scores. Remember, however, that multiple items must be structured in a way that allows them to be combined into a single overall score by summing or averaging. To measure financial responsibility, for example, a student might ask people about their annual income, obtain their credit score, and have them rate how thrifty they are. But there's no obvious way to combine these responses into one overall score. To create a true multiple item measure, 
the student might instead ask people to rate the degree to which 10 statements about financial responsibility describe them on the same five-point scale. Finally, the very best way to assure yourself that your measure has clear instructions, includes sufficient practice, and is an appropriate length is to test several people. Observe them as they complete the task, time them, and ask them afterward or, or comment to comment on how easy or difficult it was, whether the instructions were clear, and anything else you might be wondering about. Obviously, it's better to discover problems with a measure before beginning any large-scale data collection. Implementing the measure. You'll want to implement any measure in a way that maximizes its reliability and validity. In most cases, it's best to test everyone under similar conditions that, ideally, are quiet and free of distractions. Participants are often tested in groups because it's efficient, but be aware that it can create distractions that reduce the reliability and validity of the measure. As always, it's good to use previous research as a guide. If others have successfully tested people in groups using a particular measure, then you should consider doing it too. Be aware also that people can react in a variety of ways to being measured that reduce the reliability and validity of the scores. Although some disagreeable participants might intentionally respond in ways meant to disrupt the study, participant reactivity is more likely to take the opposite form. Agreeable participants might respond in ways they believe that they're expected to. Some participants might engage in socially desirable responding which is doing or saying things because they think it's the socially appropriate thing. For example, people with low self-esteem agree that they feel they are a person of worth not because they really feel this way, but because they believe this is the socially appropriate response and they don't want to look bad in the eyes of the researcher. Additionally, research studies can have built-in demand characteristics. So these are subtle clues that reveal how the researcher expects participants to behave. For example, a participant whose attitude toward exercise is measured immediately after she's asked to read a passage about the dangers of heart disease might reasonably conclude that the passage was meant to improve her attitude. As a result, she might respond more favorably because she believes she's expected to by the researcher. Finally, your own expectations can bias participants' behavior in unintended ways. There are several precautions you can take to minimize these kinds of reactivity. One is to make the procedure as clear and brief as possible so that participants are not tempted to vent their frustrations on your results. Another is to guarantee participants an anonymity and make clear to them that you're doing so. If you're testing them in groups, be sure that they're seated far enough apart that they can't see each other's responses. Give them all the same type of writing implement so they can't be identified by, for example, the pink glitter pen that they used. You can even allow them to seal completed questionnaires into individual envelopes or put them in a Dropbox where they immediately become mixed with others' questionnaires. Although informed consent requires telling participants what they will be doing, it does not require revealing your hypothesis or other information that might suggest to participants how you expect them to respond. A questionnaire designed to measure financial responsibility doesn't have to be titled, Are You Financially Responsible? It could be titled, Money Questionnaire, or have no title at all. Finally, the effect of your expectations can be minimized by arranging to have the measure administered by a helper who is blind or unaware of its intent of or any hypothesis being tested. Regardless of whether this is possible, you should standardize all your interactions between researchers and participants. For example, by always reading the same set of instructions word for word. Evaluating the measure. Once you've used your measure on a sample of people and have a set of scores, you're in a position to evaluate it more thoroughly in terms of reliability and validity. Even if the measure has been used extensively by other researchers, and has already shown evidence of reliability and validity, you shouldn't just assume that it worked as expected for your particular sample and under your particular testing conditions. Regardless, you now have additional evidence bearing on the reliability and validity of the measure, and it would make sense to add that evidence to the research literature. <laughs>
in most research designs, it's not possible to assess test-retest reliability because participants are only tested once. For a new measure, you might design a study specifically to assess its test-retest reliability by testing the same set of participants at two separate times. In other cases, a study designed to answer a different question still allows for the assessment of test-retest reliability. For example, an, a psychology instructor might measure his student's attitude towards critical thinking using the same measure at the beginning and the end of the semester to see if there was any change. Even if there is no change, he could still look at the correlation between student scores at the two times to assess the measure's test-retest reliability. It's also customary to assess internal consistency for any multiple item measure, usually by looking at a split half correlation or Chromevox alpha. Criterion validity can be assessed in various ways. For example, if your study included more than one measure of the same construct or measures of conceptually distinct constructs, then you should look at the correlations among these measures to be sure that they fit your expectations. Note also that a successful experimental manipulation also provides evidence of criterion validity. Recall that McDonald and Martinow manipulated participants' moods by having them think either positive or negative thoughts, and after the manipulation, their mood measure showed a distinct difference between the two groups. This simultaneously provided evidence that their mood manipulation worked and that their mood measure was valid. But what if your newly collected data cast doubt on the reliability or validity of your measure? The short answer is that you have to ask why. It could be that there's something wrong with your measure or how you administered it. It could be that there's something wrong with your conceptual definition. It could be that your experimental manipulation failed. For example, if a mood measure showed no difference between people whom you instructed to think positive versus negative thoughts, Maybe it's because the participants didn't actually think the thoughts they were supposed to, or the thoughts didn't actually affect their moods. In short, it's back to the drawing board to revise your measure, revise the conceptual definition, or try a new manipulation.